So we'll go ahead and start with our agenda, but I did want to, to make just one quick announcement. Um, I believe that I've, I've shared with, with pretty much everyone, all of our CMIs um, that I've had the privilege of, of hosting, but my husband and I are expecting our third baby in just a few short weeks. And um, moving forward, I've decided to stay home with our three children. And I just wanted to thank all of you on this call today, and even for those who who aren't on the call, for allowing me to to walk alongside you guys and serving marriages <clears throat> across the U.S. for the past couple of years, it really has been such an honor and one that I will always remember and cherish. And please know that I will continue to pray for each CMI and the influence that you guys have over your respective cities. So so thank you guys again. And while it was a, a bittersweet decision for me to make, I know that the CMI project will be in good hands with the new director of the Community Marriage Initiative, Stephanie Altmans, who is just the perfect fit for this position and has such a passion for, for serving God and serving others and for serving marriages and couples. So with that, I will turn it over to Stephanie to say a few words. Let me get myself off mute there. <laughs> all right. Well, first of all, I just want to say what a pleasure it is to meet all of you and how blessed I am that, to have this opportunity to be able to serve your CMI. I'm excited to see what God's going to do through your ministries, and I am honored that I'm going to be able to help and support in some way. For those of you that haven't met me yet, I'll just give just a real brief a little about myself just to let you um, know a little about me. I grew up in ministry. My dad was a pastor, and so um, growing up, it wasn't just mom and dad going off and doing ministry and us kids doing our own thing, but we did ministry together as a family, and so I I grew up with a deep love for the church, for the body of Christ, and for ministry. And um, when I married my husband, Scott, I've been happily married to him now for 32 years. He's at my absolute favorite human. <laughs> and today we actually are celebrating the 33rd anniversary of our very first date. And we'll celebrate 33 years of marriage in September of this year. So um, we, when we got married, we decided early on that we wanted to do ministry together and that we wanted to make kingdom impact together. And so we've spent the last three decades doing just that. We've, we've worn many different hats in ministry, as you all probably are aware. If you're in ministry, you know sometimes you do a little bit of everything. And so we have four amazing adult children, counting my son-in-law. And there's just one last thing. I don't want to take up too much time, but one last thing that I want to say is I just want to honor Katie. She is an amazing person. I I love Katie. I've been working here now for two months and I have grown to just love her. She She's so inspiring and she's done such an amazing job with the CMI project. And I am honored to have the opportunity to be able to work on the CMI project and continue on with the work that Katie began. So, and I'm happy to work with all of you. I'm excited what the future holds and I, I can't, I just can't wait to um, see what God's got in store for all of us and for each of you in your cities. So. Thank you, Stephanie. And thank you for your sweet words. And um, yes, please just know that I'm going to, I will, I will miss all of you guys greatly, but I, I would like to stay in contact and I'll probably be reaching out to Carl and Stephanie and asking how, how everything is, is going. So certainly praying and, and rooting for you guys and the influence that you'll have over, over your cities moving forward. Um, so going, going ahead and, and getting to our agenda, just as last month, you know, our agenda again is kind of short and sweet in terms of the number of guest speakers we have. But if you attended last month's training event, then you, you know, you already know how valuable and rich the training will be yet again today. So Mr. Dennis Stoika, who, who we all know as the founder and one of the funders of the CMI Fund, um, he will be providing a 90-minute follow-up to last, last week's applied grant writing training, where he will be using the next hour and a half, approximately, as kind of a debrief of the TPP1 grant application process. And our hope is that there, these recordings, both last week and this week, coupled together, will create a very valuable resource for both our current as well as our future CMIs. So without further ado, Dennis, whenever you're ready. 
Great. Thanks, Katie. And Katie, I want to second uh, what everybody has said, just how much we have all appreciated your uh, service and your contributions to the field. So thank you and, and, and best wishes to you going forward. Thank you. Good. Then another introduction, I just want to swing my camera around and uh, introduce Charles Bruce. Sure, I am at my apartment building in uh, Houston, and, and the apartments is actually the fundraising vehicle for the CMI fund. That's where the money comes for, really, you know, your grants. And so Charles has uh, been the manager here for 13 years <laughs> and taking care of the apartments in the 86-unit apartment building in Houston. I was not actually planning to visit the apartments. I had a flight yesterday from uh, Panama City Beach to supposedly Tulsa that uh, flew through Houston and my connecting flight got delayed. And so uh, at around 10 last night, I said, hey, why don't you come pick me up? And so we are. So I got delayed 24 hours. So uh, that's where we are. So I thought uh, Charles might enjoy having this window, seeing this window of uh, this work that we're doing. So perfect. All right. So um, uh, at one point I was told uh, that when you're doing training, it's a three-step process. Step one is tell them what you're going to tell them, and then tell them, and then tell them what you told them. And so uh, there's some value to that. And so one way to look at it is that a month ago, March 17th, when we got together, we laid out the theory of grant writing, and we invited those CMI funds that uh, grant, CMI fund grantees that wanted to, to participate in a I call it laboratory, uh, affectionately known as <laughs> Dennis Doika Grant Writing Boot Camp, uh, to really have a chance to apply the theory. And uh, those grants were also, those applications were submitted Tuesday of this uh, week. We gave people a chance to rest for the last couple of days and come up for air. Um, and now it's a chance to debrief. And the way we're going to debrief is we're going to we're going to walk through those twenty one points. But instead of me providing a description of what they are, because I did that a month ago, instead, you're going to hear from most of the points uh, from a couple of folks that actually were involved in writing these applications and uh, share, hear their perspective on what it meant for them. And the way we did this is I listed all 21 of those points uh, in a Google Sheet and then had their names across. And I said, hey, choose the ones that you would like to speak into. And so that's the process we're gonna take. Uh, we're gonna hear, uh, I'll be the kind of the facilitator of it, trying to move things along. These calls usually are for an hour from, from 12 to one central time. But I, I said, you know, because of the richness of this, I suggested that we will uh, schedule this for 90 minutes. Most of you did not know that in advance. So I realized many of you may have to leave uh, at the one o'clock central time and feel free if you have to. Uh, because it will be recorded. So you'll have an opportunity to uh, pick up the rest of it um, as we go along. All right, with that as an introduction, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And I'm just really going to be walking off. Oh, um, whoever it is, is the host. If you could please um, allow me to share screen, that'd be appreciated. You should be good to go. We should be good to go now. All right, so actually, let me see how to do. We'll try this. Yeah, so I'm just using the exact same presentation that I did March 17th. And by the way, if you'd like to look at that, I believe, well, everybody that was on the call on March 17th was provided a, was emailed a copy of the presentation. All right, we're just going to kind of walk our way through it. And let me see, it should be work like this. All right, and so um, <laughs> we'll just kind of start. And probably the way I'll do it is uh, I'll read what it says on the on the on the sheet, and then I'll be calling upon various people. And those of you, if you didn't get my email, is that on the Google sheet I highlighted in red those of you that I'll be calling on. I will ask your comments to be relatively brief because we do have twenty one points, and and for many of them, we've got two or three people that are going to speaking in. But just kind of. You know, what did it mean to you? Why was this important? Or what did you learn about it? Um, and kind of the way I look at it is that is that we all went into it with these 21 points as theory, but now we have a lived experience on what it what it what they meant. And so I think they have a, a deeper meaning for, for everybody at this point. So what I said is there's 
There are two important qualities of a high quality grant application. You've got to have well, you've got to have a well-designed project or intervention, and you've got to have a well-written application. But only a very low percentage of grant applications contain both of those elements. Um, uh, the two people I've asked to speak on that or volunteered is Ray and Jerry. So Ray, what would you like to add to that? Well, I'm kind of new uh, to the grant writing process. That's not kind of totally new, still a rookie. Uh, and I'm new to many of you uh, because I haven't been a regular part of this monthly training, but I serve on the team with Mark Ellis and Jason Ancaro in Little Rock. And I lead a church network here called City Church Network of Arkansas. And the, the Community Marriage Initiative is a key initiative for us. And, and, and Mark and, and, and Jason. And I'm going to interrupt for a second. Would it be possible, whoever the host is, is that when the person is speaking, would it be possible to spotlight them if we can do that? Yes, I'm Ray. trying to find him. <laughs> on here. Okay. Yeah, so uh, when I call somebody to speak, raise your virtual hand, and that should move you to the front of the queue, hopefully, and that might make it easier for Stephanie to find. And to raise the virtual hand, you'll go down to the bottom, it says reactions, and you'll see a place. And while we're doing that, I just want to acknowledge really the four groups that did go through this process completely. And that is the Arkansas, the Rock Arkansas team, uh, the Tulsa team, uh, the um, Springfield or the Missouri team, and uh, did I mention Austin. And then also, of course, Bay County participated uh, as well. So to all of those uh, stalwart champions who survived. Uh, want to congratulations and acknowledge all of you for doing that. So very good. Ray, go ahead and continue. So when we were on this call a month ago and, and I saw this first point, I had no idea what this fully meant, but I trusted it by faith, uh, Dennis. And the part that really resonated was, uh, I don't want to enter into this process just to get money or to apply for money, it really has to advance the mission of what we're trying to do. And so uh, I, I wasn't sure at the time exactly what that would look like, but I told people multiple times, hey, I learned on this call from uh, the boot camp we're in from a guy who does this all the time. If, you do, if you're going to do this successfully, you have to have a project that you believe in enough that you would, when it's over, if you didn't get funded by by the grantor that you applied to, you'd go find funding somewhere else. And so I said, we want to have that kind of project. And then and then we have to get in the minds of the people who grant the money and think like they think and speak their language. And we, at least I didn't know how to do that. So we, we hung in with the process and by God's grace, I uh, got word that our grant had been submitted uh, and, that, and received nine minutes before the deadline on Tuesday. So Super. thankful for that. But Dennis, here's yeah. the part that I would, uh, here's the part, here's the part I wanted you to hear is, you know, after going night and day, that was the other thing you said is that we needed to pre be prepared to set some things aside and really give ourselves to it. So we had team members that went night and day the last week or so on this. I got up the next morning early and when I expected to be tired and exhausted, found myself energized about not wanting to wait till I heard whether we had received the grant, but wanting to start getting the people in the project together in the next couple of weeks to start working on the project. And I went, oh my goodness, what Dennis said we needed to do actually happened for me, is, is yeah. I, I'm excited about the project that, that, that the process has helped us reach. Yeah, perfect, wonderful, thanks. Jerry, what would you like to add? Yes, um, I say this often that uh, anytime that we have something that's worth doing, we need to make sure we look at vision, identity, and purpose, whether that's our relationship with Christ or relationship with others or doing a ministry or a project such as this. And so we took some time to make sure that, um, that we had the vision for this, that this was in our identity as an organization, and that it was going to be done with purpose because Whenever things get difficult and things got difficult, um, we were able to hang in there knowing that we were doing the right thing. And so we knew that we needed to persevere because we had those elements 
in this project. And so, um, you know, for us, um, that's a, that's a big thing before we do anything. Like I always tell Kate, why are we doing this? Well, and then we know why, because we've talked about it, but, um, but besides that as a foundation, um, yeah, we, this project needed to be well-designed. And, um, and so I'm, I'm, I'm kind of a designer. Um, Kate makes it look pretty, you know, a lot of times, and there's a lot of work in that, a lot of detail, a lot of things that I don't like to do, but, um, building out the structure and having this, some well, some some strong pillars and a good design, um, and and so when it, as far as the design goes, I kind of work on that. But as when it comes to the well written, that's the Kate's good at that. She's good at yeah. at um, making it look good. She makes me look good, and uh, so we worked really well together. But if you could find some kind of uh, um, some some of those elements in your own project where someone can focus on those elements and just work to, together um, as a team on that. So yeah, good design, figuring out what's going to go in there, what's in what order, you know, going through the the criteria and matching up a, you know, apples and apples and oranges and oranges. Um, that's part of the design. And you can't just do it. You have to design it and and then lay the, you know, lay the details on top. So that's kind of okay. our takeaway for that particular topic. Thanks, Jerry. All right. So the next one on too is you got to really understand the funding announcement, in this case, NOFO, and give what they're asking for in it. And what we say on this is that really could be the most important point you'll ever hear about uh, grant writing. And actually, when you step back and look at it, the whole process of writing grant is actually quite a bit easier than it seems because in general... Everything you, do, you need to know is in the funding announcement. So the first step is you've really got to become an expert on the funding announcement. And so uh, a few people I'd like to speak into that might be Saul, Kate, and Joetta. So Saul, what would you like to add or amplify on that? Um, hey, everybody. Yeah, I. the further we got into the process and the more times I read the NOFO, it, it just seemed like there was more and more and more that I was becoming aware of. Um, and like, it's not just the text of the NOFO, but all of the links and resources that they share. Um, I don't know what it is in my brain, but I, I see a link or I see a reference and I tend to just kind of skim right past that. Um, instead of taking the time to actually pull that up and then read that too. Um, I guess part of it is I, I think, man, this NOFO is big enough to, to try and read and comprehend without exploring every single link and reference. Um, but really, if you don't do that, you wind up costing yourself time later because there's answers in those references that you're going to be searching for. And often it, it just spells it right out for you if you just take the time to explore that link. So, yeah, good yeah. point, Saul. Thanks. Kate, what would you like to add? Uh, I would really echo what Saul just said, um, that it was important to go through and look at all, like, the first thing I would do probably from now on is look at the resources in the NOFO before I do anything else. And then to read through it and get to know it, this is mine and it has been beaten and battered and it's, it's, it got to the point where someone would ask me a question and I could say, that's on page 43, that's on page 22, that's on this. And that's how well you need to know it because it was a huge time saver. Um, I would take it to bed with me and read through it even when I wasn't, <laughs> when I was just, you know, trying to, to see what I was going to miss because you don't want to miss anything. And I know you're going to talk about it later, but just highlighting and making notes. And uh, the more you do that, the more you're going to remember it so that when you're in crunch time, when it's that last day, you're going to go, I remember that. I remember that. I know what to do. Yeah, exactly. Good. Um, and Joetta, Joetta was a, a recent addition to the Bay County uh, group. Babe, uh, Joanna, what would you like to add? Dennis, well, she's yeah. not on yet. Um, I'm sending her the link right now. She thought it was your your Zoom link, so I'm going to send it to her right now. Got it. Okay. Well, we'll let her. Uh, we'll. Uh, uh, yeah, we'll come back to her on that then. All right. Um, then the third point is. 
Oh, it went too far. Huh. I apparently have uh, left it off. Well, the third one is uh, get into, into the world of the author of the funding announcement. That is funny, though. Let me try it one more time. No, it's just on mine and it just missed out. Uh, we say get in the world of the funding, of the author of the funding announcement, understand what it is they're really looking for, then deliver it. And just give them what they're asking for. And this, the next point is so key. And I think those of us that were on the panel review panel really got this. It says make it easy for them to find it. And we say we may want to consider organizing narrative in the order of the criteria sections. And then within each major section, provide the information in the order that the information is asked for. And then use signposts that the reviewers will easily recognize. You may want to start sentence with keywords or phrases pulled exactly from the criteria. And then maybe consider bolding or underlining or highlighting those keywords or phrases. And we say use your judgment on that. And so um, Ray or Mark or Joetta, what would you like to add to that? Yeah, I, I guess I really spoke a little bit in the, you know, kind of on, on number one. Uh, but that was especially critical from my perspective because I it was totally new process and new language. So it was immensely helpful to just follow what they were saying, understand that, and try to give and then try to provide that back. Yeah, good. Thanks, Ray. Mark, is there anything you want to add to that? Is Mark Ellis on? I thought so. Paging through. I don't see Mark. And is Joanna on you? Yeah. So one thing I'll just add to that area was that don't be afraid to actually use their exact wording. Um, and so sometimes I've always felt like when I'm writing, I have to change it up or use different words that, you know, what is this, uh, the uh, word that means the same thing, but don't be afraid. And especially in those first sentences to use exactly what they've asked for, because then they can go, oh, point A, there it is. There's the answer done. And that's what you want. You want it to be easy. And I just didn't realize um, until we went through the process, how little time they really have to find the answers, nor the desire really, because they have so many to look at. And that was really just a key eye opener for me. And I really felt that um, I've always tried to change the words, but this just made it so much easier to kind of give them exactly what they want. Yeah. And I think those of us that participated in the paneling of it, that that's where it really drove home. And I noticed Kate, uh, you know, uh, nodding her head enthusiastically. Is there anything you'd want to say about that, Kate? Yeah, I would say that, uh, okay, First of all, there are two places in the NOFA where it says criteria and content. And I structured ours initially based on content, not on criteria. And then when I saw what everyone else had done, I was like, oh, so you really need to start like, like go with criteria, but then go back to content. And what I did then at the end when I was rebuilding it is search for key phrases from the content to see if I put them in the criteria so that if they ask, like we talked about rule, um, that was one of the things they asked for. Is this a rural county? Is this a rural area or not? But that's nowhere in the criteria. It was only in the content. So if you didn't look at that, you might not have put that in there and then they might have counted the point off, who knows? So yeah, so I yeah. learned a lesson about structuring definitely. Yeah, exactly. Good. And then, uh, uh, point number four is uh, understand the scoring, which is clearly spelled out, then weight your pages uh, accordingly. Hill, is there something you wanted to add on that? I think scoring is tricky because when we did the test panel, um, something that was four points or two points, as a reviewer, I was still thinking of Am I giving 100% of the points or 50% of the points? Um, and so it's important because certain sections were less points. But as a reviewer also wanting to see, does this seem complete to me? Am I buying this? Um, at the same time, we did personally find ourselves getting bogged down in some sections that weren't worth as many points. And so I think it's a balancing act. Ultimately, the whole thing needs to have buy-in from the reviewer. It needs to be believable and accountable. 
Um, but yeah, there are some sections that you can't like budget, for example, make perfect in that first go. Things are going to move around in five years. And so there's some stuff that it's okay to let go of too. Yeah. Great. Thanks. All right. So the next item um, is a suggestion that was made is that you may want to bold or underline everything that the funding announcement says that they're looking for or other key points. So this document is a 72 page document. And if you just have 72 pages of stuff, it just gets lost in the detail. So the idea was to underline some of the key things and then concentrate on those highlighted parts as you're preparing for the grant and or discussing the grant with others. And that just allowed the process become so much easier to, to get a handle on. And some folks that uh, might want to say something about that uh, would be Bruce, uh, Mark, and Kate. Bruce, why don't you start? What would you like to say about that? Yeah, thank you, Dennis. Um, you know, I, I think that that was really helpful. One of the things that I found as yeah. the more we got into it, Kate, I think, mentioned earlier that that the criteria is in one place there. We had three different places where they had information of things they wanted in this application. And the criteria had some things in there, but there were other pages that were saying, we expect, we expect, we expect. So I went through and everywhere that it said, we expect, and that, and using Dennis's uh, helpful tips to put it in a Word document, be able to search for that. But just where we, everywhere they put, we expect, I highlighted that. So I would be sure and include those things because those are things they're expecting in there. And, uh, and so that was really helpful. It did take a while. And I was just like Saul, it was just overwhelming to begin with, but I feel like by the end of it, we got to, you know, I feel like I understand a, a lot more about what they're, they're looking for. And I will say, cause I'm going to have to leave here right about one o'clock today. Uh, I've got to uh, be somewhere two hours away, but um, so I may not get down to that, but I think it was so enlightening to be on the panel review panel and uh, to be able just to see what someone's looking for that helps that, that, that helped more than anything. I would think actually, I wish we'd have done it way sooner in the process. Even. <laughs> The trouble is we needed to have an application to review before we could review it. It's a little bit of chicken and egg problem, right? <laughs> right. Yeah, no, it's worthwhile. No, super. Thanks. Uh, let me see. I don't know if Mark Ellis is on or not. If so. Okay. Ray, let me know if Ray, if Mark uh, joins us and I'll call him uh, in the future, but if not, I'll skip over him. Um, and Kate, uh, is there anything you'd like to add on this? Uh, I would just say that, so the last two days of us writing the grant where, you know, we were sleeping like three hours and crying a little bit here and there, you know, um, we had two uh, professional grant writers who we knew from like homeschooling a long time ago who were like, hey, do you want us to help you? We're not doing anything. And they said that um, they came in and she specifically said that every time they've ever bolded and underlined things that the reviewer always says, thank you, thank you, thank you that made this so much easier. And they always, she's only been not funded like once or twice. And it's because of a different reason, but that was like one of the things. And then she also suggested that you, you reiterate it. If you take the time to bold it and underline it one time, then you should put that information in there another time somewhere else in your grant. Because if you thought it was important, then you should be mentioning it at least two times. Interesting. Great. Let's came. Okay. Uh, number six is Consider starting with a logic model. I said, this is a great way to summarize your entire application on one page. Hill and Ray, would you like to speak into that? Hill, why don't you go first? Yeah, I think it's great. The logic model I didn't have any understanding of before this. I love how it ties all the components together. I believe Live the Life had a great example of this in their grant, just that first page. And I think the reviewers probably appreciate it too, to have something to flip back to that's that concise. Yeah, great, thanks. Ray, would you like to add? I wish I would have looked at the logic model uh, earlier. And I think it may have been, Dennis, when you came and, and said that you wish you'd have taken us to the resource page links sooner, it may have been that late. 
but I had been struggling with the amount of information in in the the NOFO and relating that to what we were actually trying to accomplish until I started looking at their lot at the at their logic model and then adapted that to us. And yeah. then once I did that, I could see the entire picture, the framework, and that really unlocked it for me. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. All right. Uh, okay. And then uh, item number seven, just a suggestion is to copy each criteria section onto its own page or section in a Word document, then break each item into separate bullets, and then also try to estimate the point value of each bullet. And that gives you a really good perspective on where you need to spend your time and helps you get into the mindset of the future grant reviewer, reviewer since that's likely to be how their scoring sheet is going to look. And then you need to write an appropriate response to each and every bullet, answering each one completely in a space, in a space sensitive way. Um, uh, Kate and Michelle, what would you like to say about that? So I'll go, I'll go first. Um, one of the things that um, our team did was that we did actually do that. And I'll be honest, I thought every I thought that was the normal that everybody had done that. And so when we were reviewing them, because um, we had them labeled ahead of time, 3A, 3B, 3C, um, I thought that was just part of the grant. And then when I found people didn't do that, I was like, oh my gosh, now I'm confused. I can't find things. And so truly that was huge. But I think what we also did um, when we created the uh, the Word document was we put each item and then what page numbers in the NOFO, where did you find the information about that? Just as Kate referred to earlier, it's in several spots. So every single space that um, you found that specific item was listed on that area so that you didn't have to have it memorized. Kate was amazing, I'm sure and had memorized, I did not. And so I could be able to easily flip ahead. Um, and then you, you uh, and Dennis showed us that amazing tool with just using the search for those specific words. So it was very easy to do that. And you just did that one time and you never had to go back and find it again. Um, and so I really think that was a key addition to it. And truly having it numbered that way early on made everything else so smooth. And when a reviewer looks at our grant, they can find everything in a quick amount of time. And then we kind of guesstimated on how much value. So if the whole section of three was valued at 20 and there were four, uh, you know, bullet areas, we just said five points per area, you know, it's kind of a generic um, a guesstimate on the, the thing, but it gave us a better visualization. Great, thanks. Kate, is there anything you'd like to add to that? Well, as I said before, you know, organizing it this way is making it, you know, making it so much easier for you to find the information. Another thing that we did was um, if it was like section A, then we made that a heading one. And then if it had, you know, three points underneath that, then we made the three points an H2. And then underneath that, we would do H3s. And what that does is on, if you're using Microsoft Word or Google on the left side, you can open up a navigation window. And then when you know, I need to go back up to section C, I need to go down to D, you can navigate really quickly through your document and see what points there are. And then we also highlighted them like needs work, needs, you know, this is done, this is, you know, whatever. So in the navigation pane, we could see what was done, what needed work, that sort of thing. And if you're not familiar with the navigation pane, um, what she's saying is very significant because I was able to come up to speed immediately whenever she would reference something or if we had one of our other team members. So that's definitely work, worth looking into in the Microsoft Word arena to look that up and also do, using track changes and know, knowing who's editing because we did a and we can probably talk about this on another point but we did a, a document sharing where we were all working in the same document at the same time yeah and i think you, the software you use for that jerry you said was something called microsoft sharepoint and you found that to be a very useful tool to assist that is that right right it's not my favorite for everyday use but when in a situation like this in this context it is amazing help yeah great thank you Right. Point number eight is to assume no pre-existing knowledge on the part of the reviewers. You've got to explain everything and understand that reviewers will not visit any websites you refer to. So you've got to include in your application everything you want your reviewers to consider. So that was just something to have in mind as you're as you're working your way through it. Right. Good. All right. Item number nine. Man, I'm just wow. I'm. Just, I, I apologize if this handout thing is not. Uh, 
effect. So let me do this. Let me go to the actual PowerPoint. Let me see if this will do bring it up. Let's just take a look. Give me a sec, guys. We formatted. Maybe I won't. So I guess we'll live with it. I, again, I apologize, guys. All right, back to where we were, um, which was nine. number nine. Yeah, number nine is, yeah, clear your schedules to allow time for grant writing. <laughs> it is a very, everybody laughs at that right now, right? <laughs> it is a very time consuming process, especially the figuring it out part. You have to allocate enough time to both create a really great intervention and then write it up into a well-written grant application, as we said in, in point number one. And people often confuse those two elements, that you have to design a great intervention before you start writing a well-written grant application. Uh, Joanna, this is one area you thought you might want to speak into. What would you like to say about that? Um. <laughs> When I was invited to uh, work on the grant, I was explained I needed to clear my schedule for the next three weeks and um, definitely lived out to be very, very true, even though Easter was in there and a lot of other things, but it, it is very, very time consuming in a short amount of time. Um, and so just that, that's definitely a truth. <laughs> exactly, yeah. And I did see a couple of other people kind of chuckle at that. So I'm just to open it up to, uh, to other comments on that area, whoever likes to share perspective. Well, I'll go ahead and jump in there. Um, you know, I do my best work in the crunch time, as Kate will attest, and she's a little more of a, a doing upfront work. Um, but, uh, you know, even with, good planning and you know me helping out in crunch time and her her just being solid all the way through um we had to pull in other people uh, in the last few days and we submitted 15 minutes before the deadline and we were working like bandits getting this thing done and we were multitasking and i was in one spot she was in another we had another couple of people doing something else and so um that that last day the or the last two or three days you just need to like do nothing else for real because it's an all-day affair up early bed late um if you're gonna get it done because you know we had a, a pdf merge problem and i was like hey we're gonna get it in an hour beforehand and i wasted 30 minutes um messing around with with technology trying to get it to work right so the last few days oh my gosh you know, like Dennis said, clear your schedule. And but even before then, um, you need to be very smart with your time. So um, it's very important because it could make or break your success. Absolutely. Dennis, I'd like to add that sure. I think it's important that you get your registration done with Sam.gov <laughs> earlier in the process because we bumped into that at the at the end and and. Uh, because we hadn't done it already, uh, we did not get our application in in time, and uh, which it was still a fantastic learning experience, and I have no regrets about doing it at all. But I wish we would have taken um, time to do that earlier in the process to make sure that there weren't any snafus, because there are plenty of other things at the tail end that's requiring every minute of your time, and if that would have been you know, out of the way earlier on, we wouldn't have to dealt with that. So I would strongly encourage if you have not uh, registered with uh, SAM.gov, get that done right away out of the way. Yeah, yeah I definitely yeah. want to echo what Bruce is saying is, is not only, you know, not only is there crunch time at the end with, with those um, uh, sub companies that we're submitting to on the websites, but also on the front end, way ahead, get that started so that at crunch time, you won't have to do some of those other things um, that are necessary. So um, anyway, and it's hard to hard to know the timing of that, especially 
first time around, you know, our first timers, you know, we learned and we're going to, we're going to be doing better next time for sure. Thank you. Yeah. And I, and I think kind of a, a related thing is, uh, is, uh, I think we all underestimated the amount of time it would actually take to upload the files onto uh, grants.gov. Uh, uh, and I, I should point out is I've, I've written quite a few grant applications, but I've usually had a, a support team in place where they actually would do the uploading. And so um, this was, uh, and it's been a while, frankly. Okay, And so by one of the time I got to do the, up, and they've changed their system on how to do it. So I was flummoxed, like, what in the world? Um, and so, yeah, I think that's another learning is, hey, it's it loading these forms are not just a trivial thing, and there's forms to be filled out. So I think that was a, a real missing from, from the training, as well as Bruce said, you're absolutely right, in terms of I didn't emphasize enough, um, hey, guys, we need to be getting these SAMs. You know, I mean, I... I included in what I said, but I said a lot of things. And so it just got lost. And it really wasn't until the Friday before that I just pulled the group to say, hey, where is everybody on this? And discovered that, oh, my goodness, uh, some of you had just submitted the SAM that day. And so, I mean, I was amazed, frankly, that 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 Cage was able to get the thing turned around uh, that quickly for for, for, for us. And, and ironically, you know, my organization, uh, um, Healthy Relationships Bay County, was the first one to start the uh, SAM uh, process. Uh, and no, actually, I'm sorry, was going to be submitting under a uh, U.S. Marriage Resource Center. We started that process on uh, April 8th, and uh, we never did get that one approved in time. So we had to switch entities for us to apply for. So yes, and it's interesting because the, the NOFO does say, make sure you start this in plenty of time. Um, and uh, they were right. <laughs> so yeah, lessons learned. Lessons learned. So thanks, Bruce. All right, good. So question number 10 or point number 10 is this a question that comes up a lot is, should you hire a professional grant writer? And I, I like to throw out the possibility of using a hybrid approach. That is, first you write out a first rough draft yourself, which contains all the information that the funding announcement is looking for. And then you can let a professional grant writer uh, clean up the structure, format, and grammar. Um, and a major mistake many small organizations make is putting too much of the grant writing responsibilities on an outside grant writer. And I and I throw these questions out. It says, well, how if you bring in an outside grant writer, you say, well, here's the NOFO, you know, just here's the NOFO, here's our organization, just write the application for us. How, how in the world are they supposed to design your intervention? They don't have your vision. They don't have your passion. And so um, I'm going to ask Joanna, I'm, I'm sorry, but Michelle is going to speak about that. But then I'm going to ask Kate and or Mark to speak about that because they actually did bring in a, a, a grant writing team at the very end to basically implement this strategy. Now, by the way, when you do the strategy in the future, I'd suggest don't wait until two days before like <laughs> Kate and Jerry did, but it is a worthwhile strategy. So I want to have hear Michelle first and then throw it to both Jake Ferry, uh, to Jerry and or Kate. So yeah, Michelle, what would you like to say about that? Thanks, Dennis. So um, I will tell you, I have done grant writing, small levels of grant writing, not at the federal level, for other companies before as a um, a hired position where they just brought me in to do it. And I will tell you the entire time it takes for me to get the information from them, my thoughts are always, well, I'm glad you hired me, but to be honest, you could have just typed it out and done it yourself, the first draft, and then have me come in and pretty it up. So I love the idea that Dennis put on there as a concept um, to do the hybrid approach. I think that really makes sense. Um, for our team, what we kind of, our, our idea was that we were hiring Dennis to be our grant overseer. And so we did the the initial work and then he was able to go through and just kind of throw in some great stuff, which really helped give it, um, uh, you know, the, what, what the government was looking for. And so I think it was a phenomenal way to run it. And so um, if you choose to do that, I think that's a that's a great way. But I also think even in your own company, if you have somebody read over it at the end who has not been a part of it at all as an outsider coming in to read it, as we talked about before with paneling, but somebody who do, who knows a little bit but doesn't know the whole thing can give you that cleanup formatting and grammar. I know when we were looking at some of the ones, you know, you would see sentence uh, structures or words that were used incorrectly that they probably just didn't see that's what that person can do for you and then it just makes it easy because somebody in your company and then you didn't have to necessarily hire outside 
just a thought. Yeah, great. Thanks. Oh, and then Jerry, Kate, what uh, describe how that works with you guys bringing in um, an outside team at the end. So the the best thing that I can explain it is that they went through our grant application. There's two things I'll make a point on, then I'll let Jerry kind of finish answering. They first read our whole grant application from beginning to end like a reviewer and asked the questions that they were what we were missing. Second of all, as professional grant writers, they have copy paste stuff. So like our project management section, they could just like kind of copy paste stuff from, from previous grant and then ask me, okay, you know, where do we need to fix these things? Because of our organ, they knew organizational capacity, they could copy paste job descriptions, they could copy paste, you know, like they had this, this library of 25 years worth of writing grants just like this with EBPs and other kinds of grants that they just like took so much off our plate right off the bat but yeah. I had everything I mean we had most of it done and just like Michelle was saying like you you could you have to do that she doesn't know they don't know what we're doing and they don't know how we're doing it and they didn't know our organization because like I said we the last time we talked with these people was you know through our homeschooling co-op 15 years ago or something so um so yeah that I think that would be like the most valuable thing is that they have the experience to copy paste uh, sections that aren't going to change much like that. Yeah. Then I think I would like, it, if I could add real quickly on sure. what Kate said, the copy paste aspect of that, I could see how that would be really helpful in hiring somebody because I'm not sure we could have ever done a lot of what we did if we, if we hadn't seen as, as new people, if we hadn't seen how live the life was doing it or, or some of the other, uh, things that we saw and were able to see, okay, this is how, what they're talking about. This is how it's structured. Uh, that was extremely helpful uh, to us through the whole process. So having somebody yeah. come in and be able to, you know, just give you some templates even to, to go yeah. from would be fantastic. What, what we had to do with this couple that came in. So they came in on uh, Sunday and, you know, it was due on Tuesday and like Kate said, we had uh, most of it done, but it was a little it was a little rocky around the edges. And and so they read the NOFO immediately. They ran through our stuff immediately. And so they were very happy. They were thinking they were going to have to rewrite the whole thing. And they were like, you really have a lot done here. And I think it's because, you know, obviously the training that we went through in this boot camp. But um, the thing is, is we know what is important to us we know that you know again vision identity and purpose this is our baby the lord gave it to us and we are you know making it happen in his will and his time and so if when you bring somebody in from the outside if you just have them do the whole thing it's not going to have that heart and soul in it right that comes from what god gave you to to design for this project so we had that in there and then i had to cast that vision for them I had to say, you know, before we even got started, I was like, you know, this is who we are. I mean, they knew us, but this is who we are. This is why we're doing what we're doing. This is, you know, this is the purpose of this particular thing. And so once we cast that vision for them, then they were, then they were ready and they were, they were bought in to the project and sold out for we're doing what we're doing. And I think that really like sealed it for all of us. Um, and and we had fun with it, right? Because you know this was an important thing. So be careful whenever you're considering um, hiring somebody, because I think you're like, oh, I'll just go hire somebody. But if they're not sold out for this, and 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 are you know have that catch that vision that you have for it, um, it you may not get the results that you intend to get. So just keep that in mind. Yeah. Great. Thanks. All right. Um... Wow, again, this is just off. Um, 11 is actually be proactive. Most funding streams repeat on a forecastable schedule cycle. Therefore, most surprises can be avoided by planning ahead. Uh, Michelle, would you like to speak into that? 
Uh, just real quickly, um, I know that once you get um, your uh, information into the grants.gov site, you can sign up to receive emails from them. Um, I used to get them weekly with what were the new things that came out, what were um, updates to ones that were in there, and they would kind of give you some uh, a quick glance. Of course, there's grant season, just as uh, Dennis referred to earlier, um, and you can also look at other sites, but I think that that's one thing is to, if you don't already have grants uh, research in your uh, you know, monthly or, or you know, your your grant timeline, you should add that to budget it to your time so that you know you're at least going out looking for them. Um, and that way it gives you enough time to do it. But I think getting that email from grants.gov is a huge thing to do. And you can also look, I looked this morning, they have newsletters that you can get as well. Yeah, exactly. And part of it is, you know, just just being aware of the types of grants you're looking for. Um, again, I just really wasn't even aware that this TPP grant existed. I just, it just wasn't on my radar screen. Um, and, um, you know, and now it is. And kind of along those same lines, uh, Saul's told us that, guess what? There's a sexual risk avoidance education grant coming out within sometime within the next week or two or so. And guess what? A lot of the information that we've put together for this TPP1 grant is probably going to be applicable on it. Um, the other thing is, if you kind of look at how we scheduled this whole thing, is um, you know it took me time to to read the grant app, you know the the NOFO in the first place, and then think about how it would apply to us, and then think about oh how it would apply to the other CMI groups, and then let you guys know about it and send out a NOFO. And then when I did that, I scheduled that first meeting like a week in the future. Like, hey, uh, in this week, read through this and then we'll get together. And then you guys, you know, you politely read through it because I'd asked you to, but you were not engaged either. And it took you a while to get engaged. So, I mean, really, I believe the NOFO was announced somewhere around um, like February 20th or something like that. But it took a while but before all, all of us got all of our wheels going on it. And 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 I think for, for many of you, I think there was a whole concept of, well, we've never done a federal grant. Like, why would we even think we're ready to do this kind of a thing? Uh and and I think I think especially the the five organizations that now have gone through this would now know, okay, hey, if there's a no foe in the wind. You know, we're going to read it like that day <laughs> and we're going to make a call like within 48 hours. We're either in or out because that delay for all of us, I mean, it cost us. It it cost all of us a lot. And, and I'm going to stop sharing for a sec, just, just to, to say, you know, it's kind of interesting. I went back and kind of looked at some uh, some timeline for us. And, you know, you think about it. We just paneled these things less than a week. Actually, we submitted them to be paneled on Wednesday, and the thing was due the following Tuesday. And when I looked back at Bay County's team, guys, you, you may either be amazed or horrified to hear this. Uh, it was the Saturday before the paneling that I sent an email out that said, hey, Leanne, you take the first crack at writing this part. Um, uh, Joanna, you take the first part of writing this part. That email went out on Saturday. We started, we, we got together that Monday and we needed to be submitting our first draft at the end of that Wednesday. So, I mean, these last couple of weeks, I mean, and I think that was true for all of us because, you know, we had till the end of Wednesday to submit that first draft. And I think the first one I got was like at 10, 15 at night on that Wednesday. And the last one is at 7, 30 in the morning, the next morning. So, you know, it, it was a, it, it was a while to kind of get started on this thing. And then boy, we really brought it home. So anyway, just, just kind of interesting on that. Thought I'd share that. All right. Um, Back to sharing my screen, if I can find it. Doggone it. Technology, it's nice when it works. Let's see, share screen.
All right. Uh, oh, point number 12 is if you expect your grant to be a collaborative effort, begin building your collaboration or your collaborative well before the uh, before the funding cycle, funding announcement is made. Um, Saul, what would you like to say about that? Well, and this was true for the CMI grant as well. Um, you know, thankfully, we had been doing ministry in Austin for a number of years. And so we had a lot of partnerships and man, they were just invaluable. In fact, um, I remember at one point, Dennis, you asked the group, you know, how likely is it that you're going to actually apply to this? And you had everybody write a percentage down and show it on the screen. And, and we put 50%. And the reason was, I didn't know if we had enough time to get all the MOAs signed. Um, yeah. But then um, because of those relationships that were pre-existing, it that process went so fast. So if you have those, it's a huge asset. If you don't, then man, I, I can only imagine how early you'd have to get started to really build uh, a trusting relationship enough with people that they'd sign on to this with you. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. All right. Fair enough. Bruce, what would you like to add about, add to that? Well, I think that the getting the MOAs, you need to start that as soon as you can, because uh, we had several partners we were working with that wanted to work with us on this and were really involved in what we were doing and, and pleased to do it, but they're big organizations. It's got to go to somebody up higher than them and higher and higher and maybe a national person. So it may take uh, quite a while to get approvals and things like that. And if you're talking about a school uh, district, you know, you, that may have to go to board meetings and, and uh, you know, that may be take months to get that. So um, having those relationships in place and being able to get everything signed off on you want that you need um, may take a little bit of time. So it's uh, certainly something to be uh, managing ahead of time if you can. And, and I think that's the point is that, and, and when we look at the, the marriage grants is going to come out in a couple of years. We're going to be in that same situation is you're going to be needing to be having MOAs. And so you do not want to be waiting until the announcement of the grant to say, oh, gee, let's build relationships. No, you've got, I mean, we're called the community marriage initiatives groups, right? So we need to be building deep relationships in the community in order to do our work anyway. And then, and then, it, then it pays off. So um, let me see, uh, Jerry, is there something you wanted to add to that? Sure. I think this point and the next point kind of go hand in hand, but specifically for this, um, yeah, the collaborative effort, that's huge. That's key. Um, from doing our, our CMI grant, uh, you know, just to pick on the MOAs again, um, that takes so much time, almost <laughs> kind of like your cage stuff, right? You have to start that so early um, because it could drag on for a couple of weeks be while they're going through the higher ups, like somebody mentioned, you know, the, this this person, that person or whatever. And so I knew that was going to be a challenge, not because of we had a great relational network, but getting someone to sign on the on the line and 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 do that and get the approvals that just takes a while and and we told our team we were like we just don't have the capacity for that so we assigned a couple and they did an amazing job and um just i was just so relieved when they had that taken care of for us and so that that was awesome we got to focus on other items and then again um you know having those uh, grant writing friends of ours that that helped us uh, refine what we were doing. And so that's, you know, the collaborative, that's that's the people part of the collaboration. But then there's the technical collaboration and and the tools. And um, and I Dennis, I think I told you that if we hadn't had some of the tools that we had, like we had four people in the in our narrative at one time and we were all on different sections. We had a, I don't know, we had like an eight or a 10 hour Zoom call that was continuous because I'd be like, okay, I'm working on this and no, oh, you're working on that. And being able to collaborate electronically, relationally, you know, it, it, that way, it saved us a lot of time because I know a lot of you probably wrote 
a document and either saved it or emailed it. And you may have spent a couple hours on it and then someone else picked it up. They may have spent a couple hours on it and then it went back and forth. You add up all those hours and hours where if you could have all been in it at the same time, collaborating at once, then it's like 30 minutes or an hour instead of four or five. So that was a huge benefit for us to have the collaborative tools, not just yeah. collaborative efforts. Yeah, good. All right, next term, 13. And we're going to have to start moving. We have to move a little bit faster to finish up by uh, one thirty because uh, we've done 12 points and we've got 21. So, all right, so number 13, straight, take a strategic approach to letters to support or member members of understanding uh, how important are the documents. You've got to ask the question and it'll, it'll vary from grant to grant. You got to check to see what the specific grant says about it. And what I say is that rookies use letters of support as fillers or have tos, and pros do is they use them use letters of support to make or support key elements of the grant proposal. Now, if you do that, you must refer to them or quote them in the narrative, or else they'll get lost. And then you will also encourage to consider the communication value of asking for letters of support. It gives you a legitimate reason for you to be having conversations and exposing organizations to important people that you probably want your organization to be exposed to anyway. Um, Michelle, which the people that wanted to weigh in on that was uh, Michelle, Bruce, and Ray. And actually, let's have Bruce go first because I'm we may be losing him any minute if he's still here. We may have lost him. Michelle, you go there. So the only thing I was going to add to that, because I think that's very, very, very clear. But in my county, um, our school board said it's going to take minimum of two months. There's no way we have time. Send it to us. And, you know, there's four steps before it even gets somebody to look at who can sign it. So instead, I think what we ended up using in our in our um, grant was that they sent a um, one of our counties, the school board sent a letter of um, a general letter of support for our project. So what we were able to do is show that we do have the uh, support of the school board. We just didn't have the MOA. Um, and so even though they said they didn't ex really look at letters of support, what we did was we put a quote from it in the um, in the narrative itself. And then of course included the letter in, in the um, appendices. But I think what that did was it gave some legitimacy to our um, saying that we do have a partnership with the school, uh, even without the, um, with the, uh, the, the, um, the MOA. Yeah, and what I want to add is that uh, th this particular NOFO, what's very specific, it said um, you should include the MOAs if you have them. You, you should include a signed MOA if you have them. And if you don't have a signed MOA, so include a non-signed MOA. So really, the MOAs were optional. Um, but what they did is they established credibility. So it's kind of a balance. So, so um, yeah, cool. All right, let's move on to four. Uh, let me see. Do anybody else on that one? Yeah, Bruce. Right. Ray, did you have anything you wanted to say on the letter of support? Oh, Bruce, you are back. Bruce, th this is one. Uh, is there anything you wanted to say about the letter of support? Or MOAs, I should say. Unmute myself. Uh, you just um, made kind of my point that this NOFO said that the MOAs weren't, weren't really required. Um, and you could actually even turn in an MOA that wasn't signed and get it signed. You had 60, 30 days or 60 days. I can't remember yeah. after getting funded that uh, to get them signed. Um, but like you said, it's having them signed in there. That shows that you actually have a commitment for that. So, yeah. All right. Fair enough. We're, we're going to move on. Uh, number 14 is make sure you're satisfying all of the technical requirements, the grant application. And, you know, are you a qualified applicant? If not, who do you know that could be that you could partner with on the grant? You also want to partake, pay particularly close attention to such details as page count limitations, font size, margins, page number requirements. And remember that the deadline is the deadline is the deadline and, and, and don't mess around with it. Uh, Jerry, is there anything you wanted to say to add to that? Yeah, sure. Real quick. Um, yeah, this is kind of a yes or no, right? It's um, whenever we were considering doing this, we wanted to see what the technical requirements were. What, you know, was this within the vision, identity, and purpose of our organization? And um, so we we wanted to make sure that if we were going to commit to it, that we were going to stick with it. So yeah, you I I think that's kind of an important thing. It's a short amount of time. But um, you need to make a yes or no on this. 
So I thought that was important on whether or not to decide um, you could do it. And then once you decide to do it, yeah, make sure your dot and I's, cross and T's, fonts, spacing, um, because it's kind of dumb to do all this work and not to check that. So at the very end, the crunch time, I was like, did we get all the tech specs correctly? <laughs> because, you know, it'd be it'd be dumb to have an, an excellent application and get counted off and potentially miss an opportunity for a technical requirement. So, yeah. yeah. And then and then the last point about the deadline. And so I think there's, even if you hear the stories of those that submitted successfully, what you'll hear is, oh, we submitted within 15 minutes or we got done within nine minutes to spare. And we think about that, you know, I'd consider, consider that as a cautionary tale. Like, why is it that that the one of us that that submitted earlier than any of the others submitted with 15 minutes to spare? That's kind of scary. And, and so where I think we all need to move is to say, hey, let's not play that game next time around. You know, that that is because um, the downside is just too big. And and uh, you know, I mean, the reality and I think, you know, we all want to have like the, the perfect application or as good as it gets. But what good is a perfect application submitted after the deadline? I mean, you're really better off. I mean, you know, congratulations. You might have saved your one half of a point or a point. But you actually got zero. You know, and so you know, you know, it just really is a risk reward, you know, trade off. And I, I'm speaking to somebody who has missed grant deadlines just from doing the same thing. So I mean, I'm speaking to all of us, including myself, that we all need to shift that. But I, it's a human, it's a human tendency. I mean, you know, we got an email from Richard Albertson that has said he submitted with 19 minutes to spare, and it's the same thing. Like, why are we all doing this? Um, and so we just. It's a hard, it's a human tendency, it's a, but it's a port one that we have to shift, I think. And again, I'm just seeing that it's not just me or not just one of us. So maybe, maybe we should uh, say, tell ourselves the deadline is a day or two earlier. Yeah. <laughs> and do our crunch time a couple of days or give us a couple, ourselves a couple of days to, uh, to load yeah. everything. Yeah, I, I had intended to start loading at noon. And I had a three o'clock board meeting with NARMI that I really thought I was going to be on. I mean, I scheduled my day. Okay, well, I'll start loading at noon. I'll be done by two. That gives me an hour spare. And I got the Army board meeting at three. Well, let me just say, I didn't go to the Army board meeting. So, yeah. All right, number 15, be very careful of the cow factor, can of worms factor. And I include that as a kind of a, a test to a testimony or a tribute to Patty who, who invented that. But yeah, it, 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 you don't want to be making major changes too late uh, in the thing because you, you may not have time to actually implement. All right, number 16, um, understand what you want to get out of the project and make sure that the final version of the project includes this. Don't get caught up in just chasing dollars. Make sure that you really want the grant you're applying for, that you really do. Um, uh, the two people that wanted to speak into that was Hill and Bruce. Bruce, why don't you go forward? Uh, go first. Again, I'm just not sure. I'm going to lose you. So go ahead, Bruce. Well, the, um, that was a question that we had for the first part of this. And, um, and we just felt like God, you know, wanted us to do this project. And if he wanted it to, uh, want us that to get e everything done on time, it would have been. We really can see, I can see God's hand working, but I think it is really important because uh, early on, I wasn't sure how this fit into our uh, strategic view of what we want to do and being able to uh, finally put um, things together and think, okay, this would be, I can see how this can fit with um, what we're trying to do here locally. Um uh, that really put a more urgency in it for us, which I kind of wish I had earlier in the process, but, um, but still, I think that that's a big part of it, isn't it? You know, I love the the line there. Don't chase dollars. Just be, just to be chasing dollars. Um, you know, God will provide, 
um, if he's really in in your work and it and yeah, I mean, there's money there, and if it's the right thing to do, but don't just now. I did it regardless because I wanted the education, yeah. um, and so, but um, but being able to have that thought process of knowing for sure that that's something that you want to do and it fits your vision, then uh, I think that's that's really part of it early on. Yeah, Hill, what would you like to say? Oh, I just think this is everything. I think it begins, it's in the middle and it's at the end of it. I think uh, it's one of the biggest struggles I personally had with it all the way through. Uh, having done Christian work our entire careers and worked in different countries and done different projects, we all know how incredibly broken the world is and how very much good work there is out there that needs done. And at the same time, um, it's hard, you know, to go, well, you know, what's going to take focus? Where are we going to really invest time and resources that is the most strategic? Because, of course, the need is always there for this work and all kinds of work. And so um, it's a major prayer point on what we do with our time and money and people and experiences and how we go forward always. And um yeah, it's just vital. It's just completely got to be God-led. Yeah, absolutely. All right, point number 17 is if you're going to get involved in grant writing, you got to play, play full out. And to really think about it is that 100 points is the only acceptable target to be going after. And why would you try for anything else? You know, especially these federal grants, they are highly competitive. And so just, just really go full out for it. Point 18 is... Good and bad grant applications are really easy to identify. Consider having yours practice scored by two or three of your friends and associates. Um, and I'm going to go kind of off script and 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 turn to uh, uh, both Alex Flecky uh, as well as Dave and Cheryl Belden and uh, uh, just ask, what was it like for you guys to be on the grant review panel? Uh, and and what did you learn from that experience? Well, okay, I'll go first. I'm. Uh, it's been years since I've been involved in even seeing grants. So I, uh, Dennis and my husband and I, we've been having some discussions, and so he invited me to to do this. And um, I come from a background of um, spending many years grading papers. Uh, from teaching at Cal State Fullerton, a nearby university. So at first, I was just really looking at it on that part about the writing, because uh, some of the things I, I wasn't able to grasp was, was your plans. But, you know, I felt like I learned a lot about, about what you all were doing by uh, sometimes having to kind of um, go through a lot of weeds and I, so I really appreciated from the very beginning as somebody who like maybe might be like one of the reviewers who appreciates yeah. good writing, but doesn't really know a lot about how these programs work and stuff. I, so I re really appreciated the ones that I read that blasted me with simple, direct statements about what they were going to do, and then maybe got into some details. And so, um, so I learned a lot and I, um, uh, you know, I wished I could f have finished, I didn't get to finish uh, uh, reviewing all of them all the way through, but um, but I could tell a difference right away in how I was learning based on what you all were presenting me in terms of really clear, direct, kind of vivid descriptions of the practical things that were being done. So um, so just that, that yes, I, I got a little bit in the weeds with the, the uh, grammar and spelling, but I, I, as a reviewer, I might be like somebody who is very new to this. And oh, yeah. it just showed me how important it was to be, not only have your vision in your mind, but make sure it's very practically directly stated in, in words on your grant. Yeah. yeah. And I see Ron's joined as well. I didn't see him before. Ron. So, so yeah, Dave, Cheryl, Ron, what would you like to add on as from a paneling standpoint? Go ahead, Ron. Okay, this is Cheryl. Um, I learned a lot from that too. I think it was a very valuable experience. Um, 
it took me so long to read them though in the morning, like I didn't finish either. And so I was just really focusing on every single detail. And I know that they're not going to be that way. You know, they don't have that time. Like you said, Dennis, they don't have that time, that much time to read them. And so I agree with Alex in that we need to be really focused on making sure they can find everything very quickly. Yeah, good. Ron, is there anything you'd like to add? Uh, <clears throat> I'd agree with that. And uh, I think just, you know, from the time that we had applied for grants, you know, several years ago, things have changed, of course, uh, in some ways. Uh, this was a longer uh, or, uh, RFP. And so it was a little bit more difficult to go back and forth and, and figure it out. But uh, but yeah, I thought I thought scoring uh, was good. I thought the the two or three proposals that we did score were were well done and it was very helpful. Looking forward, yeah. Great, thanks. All right, um, number nineteen is consider this webinar, uh, this one and the one we did a month ago, to be just the beginning of a new learning process. And take advantage of every opportunity you can to learn about grant writing. And we really do recommend you participate in multiple grant writing workshops and consider applying for a non-critical grant, just practice. Uh, and so really that's what this was. This was a grant, yes, we all want it, but it was a great practice opportunity for every one of us. And as we say, always request your scored applications with comments from the review panel and study those comments carefully, whether or not you recorded a, re awarded a particular grant. And really, you know, this is part of the process. And so just continue playing in it. I'm just gonna go uh, uh, continue on through. Number 20 is consider getting into a grants review panel. It's a great learning experience. And I would say, please do this. It will transform your understanding and perspective on the grant writing process, as, as many of the people said. And number 21 is get in the game. The only way to learn how to be an effective grant writer is to actually write and submit grant applications and then learn from the results because you are guaranteed to not be awarded 100% of the grants you don't apply for. Um, so I'm going to go off, off of my screen share now, just stop and say, hey, of the four groups, uh, actually, you can stop highlighting me now uh, so we can kind of see more of a panel of you if we could, if, if you can uh, stop highlighting. Um, those of you that that that, uh, um, that participated in this process, let me just ask you this. Uh, raise your real hand if you think that you now know considerably more about how to write successful grant applications today than you knew six weeks ago. As a matter of fact, raise both hands to the showing the level in which you think you've advanced. So if you think you've advanced a little bit, raise it like this. If you think you raised, you learned a lot, raise it higher. So how much have you guys learned? <laughs> yeah. 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 And Kate's just waving completely, right? Yeah. And Although think, I think Jerry sent you a video you'll have to watch uh, later and that'll give you a good idea of how awesome it was. Yeah. And so, I mean, if you think about in total, this entire CMI fund project, it's a three-year fund. It's a capacity building grant to give you guys the ability to be really growing your organization. And that's what this was. It's a chance where all of us got to learn, really got to develop our organizations. I would say that the five of us who did this, and even there were a couple that were participating on kind of a shadow way. And, you know, for example, uh, uh, Anna from, from Sammy and, and the folks from Fresno that, that participated in the panel, you learned as well. But in particular, those five organizations that played full out, man, you are a different organization today than you were two months ago. You have a skill set today that you didn't used to have. And with that, you have the ability to raise some serious money. Now, I, just, I also want to say is that, is that I heard somebody say, wow, it's like we've learned, a, we went through a master's degree program in grant writing. Actually, it was more like a bachelor's degree is is you learned a lot but you haven't learned it all you're you're only part way there you're only part way there and what i'm going to be encouraging is continue to be expanding your skill set in this level in this area because guys i got to tell you 
I tell you, this was a, a an, an interesting development for me as well, because, you know, one of the organizations I volunteer at is with Live the Life, and they've got five regions, five divisions, and each division is responsible for raising their own money and their own strategy. And boy, after going through this, I told my team at Live the Life, I said, you know what? Based upon this, we're going to really de-emphasize the amount of time we spend on private fundraising so that we can increase the emphasis we're going to spend on grant writing. I said, because you think about this, yeah, we worked a lot of hours this last month. But if we happen to get funded, we applied for 900000 for five years. That's four and a half million. I said, you know, you think about the math on that. A concentrated effort for a month to raise five years worth of funding at close to a million a year? I said, that's a lot of bake sales, raffle tickets sold and dinners, you know, chicken dinners. Now, by the way, there's no guarantee that we got that one. But so what if we don't? Like, so what if we only get a third of them? Does that mean we're not going to play full out? No, I say... Play full out for every single one. But even if you only get a third of them, when you do the math in terms of money raised per dollars per hour spent, this is so much more time efficient and cost effective than most nonprofits do in private funding. Now, by the way, please understand what I'm saying here. I'm not saying don't do private funding. That's not what I'm saying. There's got to be a mixture between the two. There does have to be a mixture. But I would say this, this look, we're, we're working in areas that improve the human condition. And honestly, there's lots of money available for that. We just need to be skillful at it skillful at identifying the sources and skillful at writing applications. What I'll say is this, as the more mastery you have around federal grants, the more successful you'll be around foundation grants. The more you develop this skill set, the more skillful you'll be at actually meeting with individual wealthy individuals and being able to say, hey, what's the world look like from their perspective? The more you build up your, your repertoire of, of and your, I mean, look at it. All the information we put together in these applications is information we can now use in all of our other fundraising opportunities. Do you know what I'm saying? So this is a really strategic skill set to have. And I really would encourage all of us, those five of us who participated in this round and those of you that didn't, is lean into this, develop this skill set. And you know what? Don't be discouraged if you don't get funded for the next three times. Who cares? Who cares? Because it's the skill set that's being developed that you want. And, and, and I remind you what Richard Albertson said, you know, in, in an email that he sent a month ago. He said, you know, before taking the grant writing boot camp, he was, I think it was zero for eight in federal and state applications. And after going through it, I think he said he was like, 11 for 13 or 13 through 15. I mean, just a high percentage shift. And that's where we all want to get to. We all want to get to the point of that we can be successful because there's lots of money out there as long as we are willing and able to do that. And this team is an opportunity where we can do that. And so there will be an SRAE grant uh, released relatively soon. Um, and as soon as we find out about it, we'll be sending it out to the group and we'll be inviting whoever would like to, to participate in another round of grant writing training bootcamp. You know, using that as a real life experience. And each you get to decide, you either do or don't want to do it. And whatever you choose is up to you. Uh, but it's 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 let's develop that skill. I will say this is that I am is a representative of the funders. I am more optimistic today about the CMI model and about funding opportunities for the CMI model. I am much more opti optimistic about that today 
than I was six weeks ago. Six weeks ago, I was hopeful, like, yeah, let's do this because there will be federal healthy marriage money coming and hopefully we'll be able to get some funders and some, some private funders. So before I was hopeful, now I'm optimistic. I said, okay, this, this can work. And I not only say, can it work? This will work. For those of you organizations that take this on and continue to develop your skill set in this area, this will work. This will be a way in which you will be able to raise substantial amounts of money that you'll be able to use for your mission. And as a result, the divorce rates in your counties, in your states, in your regions will fall. That will occur. I can see that by the amount of growth that I've seen in each and every one of you. And if this were an infomercial at this point, as I say, but wait, there's more. Because now I'm pleased to announce is those four organizations, other than Live the Life, but those four organizations that went through and participated in full boot camp. And so that includes Tulsa, Austin, um, Missouri, and Arkansas, you all were just awarded an additional $3,000 no strings attached grant from the CMI Fund as a way to thank you and acknowledge you for all the effort that you have put in over these last month to making a difference. And so that's my way of saying, I support you fully in your work. Thank you, Dennis. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Dennis. Thank you. You're welcome. So, hey, we're ending right at 90 minutes, guys. So, again, Katie, we thank you for all of your contributions that you've done through the entire time you've been here. We thank you and we wish you the best. And we welcome Stephanie in as the as the, as the new Katie. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you, Dennis. And thank you for allowing our, our CMI leaders to, to listen in on part two of, of this boot camp that has been so valuable. And especially, you know, having both of these recorded last week and this week and being able to go back and and watch those. It's um it, we're just very thankful. So thank you. And um, as always, we're just always honored to to learn so much from you. Um, and before I, I sign off, I did want to provide Stephanie's email um, just in the chat for everyone to see. And moving forward, all communications will come through her. And this is her email address. So uh, please feel free to, to reach out to her directly. Okay. And with that, I will go ahead and say goodbye for now. And we hope that everyone has a blessed and wonderful weekend. Bye-bye, everyone. <laughs>